So let's start now. Um, could you please give me a few descriptions of Arkansas, this part of Arkansas in the early 40s? Who had money, who didn't have money? Well, in the early 40s here, as, as most people know, we, like most of the South, was extremely rural. Uh, the people lived on 40-acre farms or 80-acre farms. There were a lot of sharecroppers on the bigger farms. Uh, mostly it was a subsistence living. There was very little money, no cash money, because after you paid all of your expenses for the crop and everything, there was very little left. And most of the people raised the vegetables that they ate. They had milk cows, they had chickens, they had a hog pen where they raised their pork that way. Uh, so it was a lot of self-assistance, but no cash money. Now when the war broke out and then they started the camp at Jerome and the one at Roar, well, a lot of the people here got some money then because just about everyone that could pick up a hammer and a saw from eastern Mississippi and northeastern Louisiana and southeast Arkansas would become a carpenter. And this not only gave them some money, but a lot of the people in the community, in the surrounding community, got to see a little money because if anybody had had an extra bedroom or extra sleeping place on room and board because there wasn't any facilities, hotels or nothing to take care of that many people. So they slept in barns or anywhere else they could, you know, rent a space or to sleep. So people got a little bit of cash. How about the income difference between uh, black and white? Well... To the best that I remember, like in working in the camp, the white carpenters and workers got a little more money than the black workers. Uh, on the farms, there wasn't that much difference. Uh, and same way on the sharecroppers or what. Uh, there was some difference, but uh, I couldn't give you an accurate description of just what kind of difference that was. Uh, but basically, everybody worked together. They did not socialize together, but in a field you may see both black and white working sometimes on later in the later years uh, after got vehicles to transport people, and then you'd see a large number of blacks in a field either chopping or picking cotton by, by themselves. But this was later on, not during the time of the camp and all, because you didn't have the transportation of the townspeople coming out to work on the farm that we did later on. So, Most of the labor lived on the farm, you know. I just want to get that one more time. Okay. No, no cash, right? People would actually... No, no cash. Very, very little money. And if that hadn't you... changed. We're still poor. Yeah. How about <laughs> education? Uh, the education level as far as uh, being literate would have probably been between 30 and 40%. Some of that was lack of opportunity. Some of it was opportunity because there were schools scattered around. Normally they were within a walking distance of a community and some a little further out didn't. Now that walking distance could have been five or six miles. So we did have the country schools. Now after the war when I started school then we had school buses and you know things a little better. But I'm it's a rural community. Do you have very many people here, even just locals that can teach and that are that are educated enough? That uh, yeah, because if you go back these times of the mules, wagons, the hoe handles, the cotton sacks, and then later on the rice shovel and some of the rice field, it made a lot of people decide they wanted an education. So uh, uh, a good percentage of the people in the latter 40s 
particularly when the soldiers be began to come back with the GI Bill. They saw something besides a mule behind, so they went to college and got degrees, and then the children of the 50s and there went on to college, a large, you know, a large percentage. And it surprised you how many that are from this area are world-renowned. And they, they ra was raised up here, so, you know, just because we're rural doesn't mean we're stupid. Um, how about if you have, how about your perspective on the rest of the world, or even the rest of the state, and then the rest of the country? Um, how interested were you in, um, not you personally, your little child, but... Well, you know, when you go back, if we're looking at 41, 42, 43, in that time span, uh, our horizon wasn't very wide. You know, our world wasn't wasn't very wide. Now, we did have battery radios at where you could get the world news and keep up with the war and there once in, you know, going on. Uh, if you lived out close to the mainland, close to a town, you had access to you could read a newspaper or a grit magazine or some more every once in a while. But if you lived off of that back in the rural, that type of communication was a little bit on the scary side. So, you know, we a lot of people were probably born and raised and never got over 50 miles from home. So, you know, you start talking about northwest Arkansas, you know, that was far. It was kind of like... Uh, when they began to bring in the Japanese Americans, no one in this area had ever seen a Japanese. Now we'd seen Chinese because our local towns and up and down the river and up and down the main line railroad uh, had Chinese businessmen. But, you know, we had no concept of what a Japanese would look like. Now, we may have had a few people that had seen one in some pictures or, or something, but as far as the general population of white and blacks, no, we, we had not seen any. And, and, and what does California mean to you, that they were coming in from California? Uh, where's California? You know, all we knew about California, a little bit of history of the gold rush. You know, but as far as the knowledge of California or what took place, we... You know, that much wasn't known at that time. So so can you just tell me once again, that uh, just so I can get it another way, you said before we couldn't go anywhere. Little Rock it was a foreign land. Lots of people had, had, had never been more than 10 or 15 miles from here. They didn't know, you know something like that. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> the, the transportation was non-existent, basically, other than... On the main highway, you did have a bus, you did have train travel. But as far as people having vehicles, they did not have the vehicles. So your travel was extremely limited. Uh, Little Rock is about 120 miles from here. But that would be about as far on as uh, Mexico City or New York City is to us now. You know, very few people went that far. Uh, very few even went to Pine Bluff. You know, to be born and raised never got over 10 or 15 miles from home. So the bulk of the people had no concept whatsoever of what California was or anything that, that was there. Now you told me that Californians had been trying to get rid of them. Um, in, in history, reading on history, Ever since the Transcontinental Railroad was built, where they had brought in the Chinese coolies to do the work there, uh, coming from the west to the east, and mostly Irish from the east to the west, after they met in Utah and it, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, then the California started trying to figure out how to get rid of the yellow man, the yellow horde, there were so many of them. Because they were, you know, they were hard workers, uh, very, very thrifty. And that, that was compounded long about the turn of the century in 1900 when a few Japanese began to come in. Well, uh, I think in the latter 80s, 89, 
1890s, I think a few come in and on, but as they began to come on, they were hardworking, industrious people that began to accumulate a little land in the valleys, were excellent uh, horticulturists and uh, vegetable growers, produce uh, south of Stockton was the strawberry capital of the world, which was pretty well all produced by the Japanese immigrants. And some of the other valleys, so they had began to get some toeholds of the land. And this was, Pearl Harbor furnished an opportunity that was made to uh, intern the people, which there could have been some threat to the security of the nation, I'm not sure about, but it was kind of overemphasized where they start rounding up and put into the various camps 117,000 people. Now, um, if you could look at, try, I know it's hard because you're looking everywhere, yeah. but try to look at me just because when you're looking down, it's going to be a lot less interesting. To look okay. At. So as much as you can, if I keep going like this, like up, up, up. <laughs> um, What you said before, I wonder if you could say uh, that you said people are people. We tend to be nervous about the unknown, and if they look different, it makes you suspicious. I'm yeah. I'm having you be kind of put on a different hat here and speak a little more broadly about the racism that drove the, well, of the <laughs> West. I uh, racism would have been the thing between the yellow and the white in California that helped drive this. And even in the South at that time, we had racism between the blacks and the whites. And to a certain extent, it exists today all over the United States and will probably be existing when my great-grandchildren are gone. But we can only hope that it does lessen some. And... The Japanese, when they came, it was the majority of the people here did not look at them in the same light that the Californians did uh, because they shared the same facilities when they went to town and what that the whites did, where in that day and time, the whites and the blacks did not mix. You know, there were separate cafes. Uh, some of the cafes on one side of it may have been for black customers. The other side was for white customers. You know, but, but the Japanese got to go to the white side. They got to sit anywhere on the bus, you know, so to speak, for, for, that, for that time. So the racism is... I saw it and was exposed to it was not that great against the internees. Now, we had a few people that later on become to hard, have harsh feelings because they had kinfolks and sons or husbands or whatever that was in the Pacific. And when the telegrams began to come in, well, then some, some feelings were hard and a lot of people at the time were not aware of how many of the Japanese Americans out of these two camps particularly was in the 442nd and what they were going through in Italy coming or coming up through Italy into Germany that they you know they were fighting and dying for a country and for an idea, and yet they left concentration camps or relocation centers to go do this. Now, people in this area, I, I gather, didn't know much about them before they came. There wasn't much of a campaign on the part of the government to teach them that these are American citizens that were moving and they're not dangerous. Um, do you think that... that, that in your family, did people know these were Japanese Americans that were American citizens for the most part, rather than Japanese people? 
Well, we had probably a little bit more experience with the Japanese and some of the rather local since my grandfather worked was a carpenter and worked, helped build a camp there the whole time. And my father worked there some as a carpenter and then he uh, uh, did a little bootlegging of some spirits to them. And come to know several of them quite well. And he also bought just about every chicken that was loose and for sale and within a five or 10 mile radius. Cause when something special happened, you know, I don't know whether it would be a death or a birthday or whatever. And uh, one of the families wanted to cook their own meal. Uh, they would do it over the little pot bellied stove or maybe sometimes in the mess hall and they'd want special food or what other than what the normal mess was. So he uh, got about every chicken that was loose in Southeast Arkansas, so, you know, within our little local area that could be reached to pass on to them. But, but I still think that, can you just talk about the fact that there wasn't really a campaign to educate anyone? Well, you no, know, and you know, outside of our having the contact there, I'm not aware of any what you would call campaign to let the people know, look, we're bringing in these uh, Americans of Japanese descent off the West Coast and we're going to put them in this camp to where they'll be safe till the war's over. Well, I'm not aware of any of that, but again, we got to go back and look in some of the towns, some of that information may have been passed on, but the bulk of us lived out in the country and was without really communication. Uh, a minute ago, I said that uh, we did have a battery-operated radio that was turned on to gather the news. You didn't listen to it otherwise because that battery was rather a big thing, rather expensive, so you took care of it. And the most, probably 70% of the population was in the same boat. A lot of them may not even have had that radio because we didn't get electricity out off the main line or anything to 1948. So tell me, tell me about that. Did you have electricity? Tell me no electricity, no running water? Right. No, uh, well, after we got the electricity in 1948, then you were able to put down some, uh, put some motors and pumps on some uh, of your wells that you had <laughs> that, uh, to where then we could start having running water, which led to indoor plumbing. Up until that time, you had two, three, four, five, or six room house and a path. And if you were really uptown and modern, you had a two holer. But no, we we had nothing when I, in that way, because going into the camp and through the camp, because we were in and visited with a couple of families, several, and they were out to our place and. Man, hanging in their room, light bulb. I go home, kerosene lamp. Now, they on each block had a mess hall where they all had to go to eat common there, which would have been not only inconvenient, but it would interrupt uh, family time or whatever because up until the last few years, Southern tradition has been everybody sits down at a table three times a day. And this is where your business and a lot of your training and all takes place around the table. Well, the Japanese would have probably been very similar in that, but would have got behind where it's all a common mess. Now, in the wash house, uh, now with the hot, cold running water, they were uptown. 
Because our water got hot if you put the bucket or the tub on the stove and, and heated it. So you know, there was a lot of inconvenience, but in a sense, some of us that was in and out of the camp and saw some of those things, in a sense, we kind of envied them because those two things alone was something that we didn't have. But we had not been gathered up from our homes, taken to a foreign land. Because, you know, they had no more concept than we had of California. They had less concept of that, of what the Arkansas rural delta would look like at that time. Because the camps were in the woods. Now, there was a highway and there was a railroad track, you know, right there. But basically, it was in the woods. When you went out the back gate, you went through the woods. Okay. What you said before about electricity and running water, I mean, I think you've actually said it already about the electricity and running water. How about food? You said they had coffee and tea, even if they were rationed. And a lot of people that, you know, the sharecroppers didn't even have that. Along with uh, kind of envying the running water and, you know, the electricity, to a certain extent, Uncle Sam, in providing for them, they had uh, access to foods that we did not have, probably mainly uh, coffee, tea, sugar probably was more plentiful to them, even though we were all under rationing than what some of us regular people were. And some of the rationing sometimes, it, it's not necessarily that Uncle Sam gave them coffee or tea or sugar or whatever, uh, which in providing the food for them. But when you get outside, we were purchasing. And even though there were stamps, we go back, you got to remember, this is a rural, poor area, money limited, even because everybody didn't work in the camp. And after they were built, you know, that money went somewhere, but it did give people money. But uh, the way of the farmer he normally had money only one time a year or what. So coffee and tea and sugar would have been kind of a, a luxury item anyway. So it, when you had it, you would have been very sparing. It would have been mostly coffee because up until recently, I don't remember anyone around here outside of my aunts that drank hot tea. We drank a lot of iced tea but no ice in those days. Later on, we had the ice truck run, but that goes into another era and another time. What about other interactions? Were there, um, were there dances? I mean, how, how did people interact? Well, I don't know of any dances of where like us civilians and them, we, you no know, interaction that way. In some visitation, it would probably have been mainly the men uh, that did get out of the camp and go around that they were. Because in 1996, when I went to Tescadera to see Jim and George Manji, which were in the camp, it, we'd been had a lot of interaction, knew them. One of the first men that persons that Jimmy Manji asked me about, it kind of surprised me. Because uh, he was an old black man that lived over on the bow and I, uh, bow methodomy, and I, you know, I'm kind of wondering how how Jimmy getting over there, because that's west, you know, of where he, but Jimmy was kind of in charge of the mules, on the mule teams, and of course they would get out sometime, and he'd go look for them. So he got to get around the country, and then, uh, he went over to Bartholomew fishing some, and th this old man lived at the corner there. Had, oh, well, I owned a little farm. His grandchildren still owned the land, and uh, he got to know him. And because I think that 
he'd swap fish for watermelons and, you know, different things. But he asked me, and it just kind of hit me back, you know. But, of course, he'd been dead for several years. Well, you had told me before, I, I asked you when um, the Japanese Americans landed in Arkansas, how did they fit into the racial mix? And what you said was they were like whites. You've already said yeah. that. Yeah. But you said some of the mamas didn't let their daughters go out with us, but we went to dances right. and got to know some of them. So what dances? Right. When uh, and we'll go back a little bit to looking at the racial mix on what us not knowing the Japanese and them not knowing us, and not a lot of interaction between the girls or what because they had their school inside the camp and out. We were used to races being separated, and even in a race. We were used to cultures being separated. Uh, like the blacks and the whites worked together, but didn't socialize together. Uh, Lake Village is a town that was largely uh, had a large Italian population, and being Italian, they were also Catholic. So we went to school together, we worked together, but there wasn't a socializing together. Because even on up in the early 50s, when I was in high school, we still couldn't date the Italian girls. They couldn't date, you know, the, the Italian boys couldn't necessarily date the other girls. Two reasons. They're the Italian, that's Catholic. The rest of us were something else, but not Italian. Uh, the same way we were familiar with... Uh, each town had a Jewish family or two or three. Uh, you worked together, but you didn't socialize together. You couldn't interdate. Uh, Chinese, we were from the same, same story. You know, we worked together, did business together. No socializing. Now, in there in the 50s, later on, that they were, you know, in a group. You could go and go to a dance or something that was there, but when this come along, we didn't have any of the Japanese left. They were all, you know, they were all gone. And the, the dances that the camps had, to the, to the best that I remember and what the people have said, were the USO type, and that was when they brought soldiers on furlough or whatever from Camp Shelby that would have some leave. They, got, they could come to Jerome or Roar because it was close, whereas they could, wouldn't have the time or what to go to Tule Lake or Gila River or Heart Mountain or somewhere else. See, I thought that those camps in, in, in uh, uh, Robeson, is it Robeson or what is the one in, in Mississippi, the camp? Shelby. Shelby. I thought that they imported people from here, from Jerome and Roar, rather than they, the soldiers came here. Soldiers came here. Soldiers came here. And and so there was not any effort that you could, there's no way that you could have interacted with any of the kids in camp? Uh, other than the, the in, in the, the, the Mungees were, were older men. Uh, and Daddy had a lot of interaction with them. <coughs> Won't go into some of that. The Myramotos were younger and had... Uh, they had two kids, a boy and a girl, that was roughly my age. Now, I remember when they come out once or twice to where we lived, and then we were in there a time or two. And those two kids and I, my brother, what we played together. And but, I mean, you know, kids are kids. They don't see anything long. They can play, run together, bump, go anywhere on it. And, you know, and you just don't. They hadn't learned anything yet. And, and that's true, but I think that some of the parents kept the kids from interacting. Mm -hmm. it, it could have, uh, but most of the, in the camp, the, when they did get out, it was to, more of a walking outing, or sometimes they got a vehicle and their parent may take them riding, particularly if one of the parents was a boss of a block or one of the other, you want to call it, officials, well then they could get access to a vehicle every once in a while and then they would take their family, you know, riding some. But there there was uh, extremely little 
interaction but like between male and females of the outside and the inside if you want to look look at it as that way now so you as a kid though okay end of tape we have to change tape <laughs> I got a limber. Yeah.